Hello everyone, and I want to thank you for tuning into this video. Uh, we here at Near East Observers have been watching in amazement as we have seen one full year of active combat in Israel. Most Israeli wars have lasted only a matter of weeks or days, and to see something like this extend into a period of 365 days of conflict has been quite remarkable. And we have noted a lot of the changes and a lot of the developments that have taken place. And we believe that there will still be more impacts and effects that carry on. And as a nonpartisan and non-advocacy uh, group, we're not engaged in activism for any particular side or people. Uh, we here believe that our role is best as interpreters of events and uh, just really trying to explain everything that happens, whether it's actions on the Israelis' part or Hezbollah or Hamas or some other country. We try to be a, an information venue and a way to interpret for both directions. And so we uh, watch as the human suffering has been going up and increasing during this conflict. And it has certainly broken our hearts to see many innocent civilians get caught in the middle of this conflict. Uh, many people who are innocent both in Lebanon as well as Israel and in the Gaza Strip. Uh, this war has definitely demonstrated that there is a changing perception and a changing uh, value system. And we also see this in Ukraine, where Ukraine has hit apartment buildings and brought civilians who are Russians, Russian civilians, into the conflict. Uh, just as much as Moscow has. And so we recognize that there is a shift and that there is becoming a new reality on the ground where civilians are caught in the crossfire and really regarded as fair game as long as there's even the most marginal uh, chances that the governments can justify it. And we think that that's an unfortunate and really um, bad turn of events and something that we would not like to see. So as we go through these updates and as we go through these things, just understand that Near East Observers does not take a partisan advocacy role for anybody. We're here to just explain and help further understanding. And again, this war having lasted a year, obviously any conflict in the Middle East is going to be studied. It's going to be pulled apart and dissected. And this conflict is definitely going to join that. And we will be looking towards the future and our analysis and how we can help further understanding of not only what is happening right now, but how is it going to impact the future? What's going to be the result of all this? And so we definitely enjoy our role. Uh, I am personally a research historian. That is what I started out from in 2010. I have a master's in history, uh, focus and concentration in the Middle East and Middle East militaries. And so uh, from my, my perspective, my default perspective is that of history. And that is why I try to bring a lot of historical understanding and background into these events. Because sometimes we have seen these events before, but not on this scale, not on this level. And so, and it's also sometimes very difficult to understand how to apply that prior history until certain events take place. And I would also like to say that, you know, during this war, we've heard other commentators and definitely people in the news that we love uh, say things that uh, need qualification, like it's a historic event or it'll be a moment to be remembered. And unfortunately, there's really no way to judge successfully in the moment what elements are going to be historical and what's going to be a long-term uh, event, something that really triggers and changes things. So uh, it's hard to tell what's going to be historical, and it's also hard to really pinpoint and draw a specific mark on uh, 
the beginnings of things. Some people have talked about the beginning of World War III. We're in World War III. We're going to World War III. It's all really murky and hard to tell. And I think that that will be the role of historians to help us understand, you know, did we get into World War III during this period? Uh, did this help lead us to that point? Uh, that's all going to be decided uh, out there in the future. But we just wanted to say uh, kind of a word of thank you, uh, word of thanks. Uh, thank you for um, being with us through this time. Uh, Near East Observers has been focusing and covering the Middle East since 2015. And then we switched our uh, method of operation in 2020 and definitely saw a lot more uh, reception and positive response from that. And we thank you for following us. And we continue to urge and we urge you to interact with us, to speak with us, but understand we're not going to uh, tow a particular line. And we're okay with that. And we watch as people follow and unfollow and follow and unfollow. And we take that as a badge of courage. Sorry for the touching here. Uh, we take that as a badge of pride and a reflection that we are accomplishing our mission and that we are not being partisan and just specifically pleasing one crowd or particular group of people. So thank you for those who have stuck with us through thick and thin uh, all throughout this period. All right, let's go to the map real quick and talk about a few things. As I have been talking about on LinkedIn, We've had some confirmation that there were no missile interceptions over Jordan when they were fired from Iran over in this direction towards Israel. We've had that now confirmed not only through Al Jazeera reporting, but also on the personal level. We have had in-region person-on-person communication, and they have verified that there were no missiles intercepted, at least over their position from what they could observe, in Jordan. Any other information to the contrary is either false and propaganda or a, somehow apparent misinformation that has been falsely communicated. We do know that today there was another missile launch from parts of Yemen. Uh, we know that it was, we know that that was intercepted by Israeli forces. But late last night, there were missiles which were fired from southern Lebanon into Haifa that were able to successfully penetrate the system and had some significant impact and damage. And actually, this was one of the reasons why we didn't believe that the Maj al-Shams attack was from Hezbollah and that it was likely from Syrians or may have been an accident because the crater, which we can't show here in this video, but the crater that was made by at least one of those missiles was very substantial, very deep, probably about four to five feet deep at maximum, made a very large impact crater, a lot of extra damage in the area. We didn't see that with Maj al -Shams. Uh, Despite the claim that that was a 150 uh, pound uh, payload definitely not reflected in the damage that was seen. We see much more damage here in Haifa just from one missile that got through. So we're watching a trend here, and it's a very important trend to take note of and to perk your ears up. We're noticing that, number one, Jordan is drifting out of the Israeli column and drifting more towards the Arab column. And we believe that they are now at least in the soft participation column where they are not doing the interceptions. They are sending active aid to Lebanon. And so we see them as becoming a, um, a force to kind of counterbalance what Israel is doing. We've seen that tick upwards since the Israelis entered into Lebanon. And we believe that they perceive uh, what was happening in Gaza, as well as the West Bank, as an internal security matter. And that now that Israel has gone into Lebanon, they perceive that in a different light. 
very important uh, to note that shift. Now, will Israel strike Iran? Very good question. A lot of people are asking this. How will it happen? When will it happen? I'm actually, frankly, surprised it hasn't happened at this point. Uh, Israel has lost a lot of deterrent power and has lost a significant advantage by delaying for as long as they have. Uh, we imagine that at this point, the Iranians have moved uh, missiles to underground bunkers and facilities around the country, and that they have been able to reinforce and harden their defenses around missile, well, around nuclear sites. So they've probably added more any aircraft missile systems and other means of keeping Israeli jets from penetrating far into the country. And we've been asked whether they would, the Israelis would attack oil facilities. If they do, it would definitely be along the Persian Gulf. As we have stated on our LinkedIn post, that would be kind of a bad thing. Uh, not only would it produce uh, an environmental impact, but also again, oil off the market is oil off the market. And so Israel would lead the United States and several other countries into facing harsher economic terms. And obviously the United States is the biggest and most important ally that Israel has. Definitely the UK has some influence and trust with them, but not as much as the US. And we believe that because the Biden administration is facing a, an election where they're hoping for a kind of like a soft second term through Kamala Harris, that they have been advocating against the strike on oil facilities simply to not hurt the U.S. domestic economy. Now, whether they would go after additional sites such as the nuclear sites, that still is uh, yet to be determined. We agree with some analysis that we have heard that <clears throat> The Iranians have now had sufficient time to prepare for that. And as we have said, to either add uh, additional layers of protection against the strike or to remove uh, key technology or resources that could be taken away from them in a strike. And so they have probably moved anything that is movable uh, out of those sites and transported them to locations that the Israelis either don't know about or would not be able to access as well. So that leaves uh, a potential for a decapitation strike. A decapitation strike against uh, Iranian leadership is definitely very plausible. We have seen how they have been able to assassinate leaders uh, and know exactly where they are when they are there. And so I'm sure that leadership is probably dispersing into undisclosed locations and in alternative places that are additionally hardened. So hardened facilities where it's harder to reach them. This is serious. Uh, if Israel did attempt to do a decapitational strike, it could cause some temporary chaos in the country and it would allow for the opportunity of internal uh, rebellious groups such as the Mech uh, to have uh, uh, internal insurrectional groups to have an opportunity to attack different facilities and sites throughout the country and possibly take advantage of a leadership vacuum. But again, with the lag time, a lot of those moves are very successful if you don't have a lot of lag time. And we believe that Israel's best window of opportunity was anywhere from between Tuesday to Saturday. That was their prime opportunity to move in and strike and take advantage of a little bit of chaos. But now Iran has been provided with so much lead time and so much lead intelligence. I mean, so much of this has been covered in the media and they're watching our media as well, that likely there's nothing that Israel could do or a target that they could uh, strike that would be a total surprise. Now, 
I say that knowing that uh, Hezbollah was certainly surprised to know that their pagers were detonated and their cell phones and other devices were hacked and were, you know, turned into miniature grenades and explosives. Has Israel done the same thing to Iran? It is possible. And as we have said before, definitely the countries immediately around Israel, but any nation that poses a potential threat to Israel, I believe that they should be very worried and very concerned about the safety of their product lines and about anything that might be coming to them from the outside, anything imported in that could be potentially weaponized. I think that you definitely have to consider the possibility of sabotage at some point in the supply chain. And I think that is going to be the most remarkable impact that Israel's attack on Hezbollah has. I think that many countries will need to adjust their supply chains or change uh, their processes between reception and distribution. Uh, some of these sensitive electronic devices or devices that could be sabotaged and turned into weapons will need to be uh, more closely examined and we'll have to go through a more rigorous inspection program in order to make sure that there's nothing nefarious that has been planted inside that device. So we are looking at a region that is at war and that's the thing that I wanna end on. I, here in the news media, the phrase, are we on the brink of war? We're on the brink of war. You know, could we go into a regional conflict? Well, we have Iran fighting Israel. We have Syria fighting Israel. We have Israel fighting Syria. We have Israel fighting Lebanon. We have Israel fighting Iran. And as we have said, we're putting Jordan into a soft engagement column. So this pretty much constitutes a region, and we have groups in Iraq and the passive permission of the Iraqi government uh, to launch from there, uh, launch drones and missiles from their territory. So for all intents and purposes, we are in a regional war. Uh, and any countries that are engaged in the war are probably already engaged as it is. And we could only see further development and intensity come from Jordan. A little bit further intensity come from Iran. Uh, right now, we don't evaluate chances of Saudi Arabia becoming substantially involved. Oh, and yes, we do have Israel and Yemen fighting each other. That constitutes a pretty good territorial bulk of the Middle East region. Uh, so. Short answer, yes, we are involved in a regional war. Right now, that regional war is substantially one-sided. Uh, it is being fought principally uh, by Israel against regional powers, and regional powers are beginning to respond in different ways to the Israeli aggression, uh, the Israeli war on them. This is also why I refrain from using terms such as Israel is facing an existential crisis. Uh, that was 1967 and 1973 when tanks from other countries and soldiers from other countries are pouring over the Israeli borders. We don't see that right now. Right now we see Israel being the principal fighting force and going aggressively into Gaza, the West Bank, uh, Lebanon, Syria, and even as far as Iran. So it would be a very new definition of an existential crisis uh, for me if that was in any way justifiable. I think that the reaction that I'm getting from Middle East, from the Middle East and from people that I know People text me, people call me, people ask me, am I safe? Am I okay? And I have to respond, honestly, I don't know. Because they're more at threat 
from Israel than Israel is threatened by them right now. And that's just an honest truth. Another hard and bitter truth is that the Middle East cannot depend on the international community. If depending on the international community was a part of a futures market, I would be losing a tremendous amount of money right now because the international community and even outside extra, out, extra regional has done absolutely nothing to come to the aid of the Middle East uh, in any way whatsoever. Uh, the Biden administration has just merely issued a lot of paper statements. So has the UK and the United Nations. It's been a lot of paper statements and thus meaningly meaningless actions and works. So if there is going to be a, a cessation or a dampening of these hostilities, it's going to have to be regionally generated. It's just going to have to come from the region itself. Uh, right now, the region is facing a uh, United States that is significantly uninterested in interceding into regional problems in the Middle East, specifically with armed forces or anything more than what we have seen so far. The United States has been trying to intercede and try to knock some of these missiles out and things to try to prevent Israel from galvanizing and exacerbating the situation in the Middle East and inflaming it even more. But yet we have seen that Israel has been very fine with uh, finding ways around that and seeking to still create a larger sense of conflict in the region. So it all boils down to we are in a regional conflict. The international community is not interested and not really in any position to do anything more, especially since the majority of equipment and material is going to Ukraine. And so not even really NATO is in a position to substantially intercede on anybody else's part because of these two conflicts and the different priorities that the administrations have. So that is the Middle East today, and that is the Middle East at one year after uh, Hamas went across the border with Israel and conducted one of the most extensive attacks on the nation of Israel in the last 20 to 30 years. And now we are at the stage of a regional conflict. Thank you.